to another episode of Suds with Luds. Uh, today, we're going back in a time capsule, uh, back to the island in New York. Uh, last week, I had uh, Chris Chelios on. The week before that, I had Chris Nylon on, which relates more to my next guest. Chelly's a Hall of Famer. Neither, I'm not one. This guy, Mick Fakota, is not one. But, Mick, you were a glue man in the NHL. You were that guy that did all the shitty stuff that I think you like to do. So welcome into Suds with Luds, Mick Fakota. How are you doing? Luds, great to see you. I'm doing well. Um, just recovering from a weekend out on Long Island. We went <laughs> out for uh, Lee and Aiden Foundation. Remember Joe McMahon, our trainer? Uh, he has a foundation and he does an annual uh, charity golf tournament. And it's not, it's a golf tournament. I think you would love because it's not about golf. Uh -huh. It's literally about uh, slamming cans, yep. music blaring, yep. uh, Buffalo wild wing girls out there throwing wings in your face. It it was a, it, it's a, it's a sight to be seen. And it's, it's one of the funnest events that I get to do. What, uh, what's the charity for? So Lee and Aiden Foundation is uh, one of Joe's children passed away from a blood disorder. And Aiden is a nephew who had a similar fate from a different disease. And so he puts money back into the hospitals and the rehabilitation of these, these young children who, who suffer through this diagnosis. So uh, I'm going jumping ahead. I was going to get into this alumni stuff later, but since we're on the topic, um, do you do a lot of that on the island? Do, do the Islanders have a, I know in Dallas here, we kind of, you know, we do our different things. We have hockey games and things like that that we do, but how about on the island? What kind of events do you guys do? Do you do a lot of them or, and how often? So not a lot, uh, but the, the, when they do them, they do them well. Uh, th this year was, I think the fourth year and I've gone back for alumni weekend and it's a weekend. So the, the premise is whether you've played one game or 700, you're invited to alumni weekend. All you got to do is get there. Mm -hmm. Once you're there, everything is covered. Hotel. Uh, this year we had a whole floor in the um, Empire State Building to ourselves, full catered dinner, music. Um, and they always have some kind of event for us to, uh, uh, whether it's, we, we go to a game, but then they always like have a, a rooftop Manhattan bonanza where there's just cocktails and, and drinks are flying and, and everything's you know on the cuff they they take you limos buses whatever you need and you you know you can bring plus one if you want which a lot yep. of guys do we have a kid i can't remember his name from czechoslovakia played one game every year he comes flies his wife and his son and they make a trip a, a, you know a week of it in new york but you know, I asked him, I'm like, hey, one game. And you, he goes, well, first of all, my son never saw me play. So this is a chance for him to experience, you know, what I got to do for one game. And uh, I really appreciate John Ledecky and Malkin and all those, that new ownership group that, you know, you said they had you there to, to pick your brain and get some ideas. They're constantly asking us, you know, what do you think? What can we do better? You know? They make a real conscious effort to treat us well. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, Mick. I, I had an opportunity to come out to the island, uh, I think it's two, three years ago. Um, we have, uh, I have a good friend in Rob Shickley, and, and Shick is uh, helping the Islanders out. Rob was a PR guy here in Dallas and uh, for a long time for the Stars. So Shick is now involved <laughs> with the Islanders and his sister, Annie, um she actually works closely with scott malkin and she runs uh scott's got a lot of those uh I don't know, retail stores or uh high-end uh stores in different countries and stuff so annie runs a lot of that and i'll tell you what i i was there for like three days and not even being well i guess i was for a cup of coffee but not being part of that organization for a long time uh, you're right they they do an unbelievable job um 
they take care of you everywhere. I mean, the dinners that I went to, I was there and the people that I met and, and, you know, it hasn't changed. I mean, I, I was there for a short time and I remember it was first class then. And you mentioned something. So I want to go backwards a little bit. I heard you say plus one, if they bring it. So bring, let, t let's talk about plus one. Let's talk about Mick and his family. What, uh, what's shaking there? I, do, do I see you have three, four kids or something like that? Yeah. It's like five boys, but it, it, um, wait, 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 five boys. Yeah, from three different people. <laughs> All right, that's where I want to go. Let's get there. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, you're probably not surprised. Ma Marilyn and I are divorced. Um, that was my first wife that you would have met um, when we were on when you were on Long Island. Uh, Twenty years, three boys, get along great now that we're not married, which is you know the norm. And uh, and then I remarried, had another son. And then there's that little episode out in Utah where I hooked up with someone that couldn't conceive, and then I, I apparently it was a miracle from up above, and and pada, another boy, and yeah. So you know how gullible you know. I, I just I'll believe anything, lads. If I you know if, if I have to drink a a Tabasco and one fifty one rum shot in Wisconsin to not get my head shaved, I'll try. <laughs> See, I love that memory. We, I, I just went to a, a friend of mine, his son's wedding uh, a week ago, and, and that story came up. That guy's name is Poon, uh, talking about the, the, the Tabasco shot. He, he has a shot of Tabasco, and then he takes the lime, I think it was, and squirts it in his eye for some stupid reason. So, yeah, you wanted to keep your hair in that thing, didn't you? Yeah, <laughs> there was a little bed on the table. Well, yeah, we I think we played uh, six five four or whatever. Yeah, we, we rolled dice and then sure, and, crew. and then you were like, yeah, oh, it's uh, the first one out gets his head shaved, and then I don't know who it was, but you're like, oh well, we'll just do the last one in. Doesn't have to. Now, obviously, I lost. <laughs> and then I'm like, you're like, no, seriously, you see these guys here? They're gonna shave your head. <laughs> and I was like, there's gotta be a way out. Let's. I'm getting married in two weeks. You're like, well, I mean, we can always ask for the house shot. And if you can put that, I mean, I didn't even make it to the men's bathroom. I puked in the ladies' bathroom. It was the closest one. Like, remember, my eyes were so bloodshot. Oh, it's funny. It's funny. You, you, you puked, wait a second. You puked in the women's bathroom? Yeah. Oh, I don't remember. Did she get pregnant? Anybody get pregnant? While <laughs> no, got pregnant. Fortunately, there was no one in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that was like at noon prior to my flight. Then. Yeah. I think Snake Snedden was with us. Yes. And yep. so uh, we flew to Minnesota together and had a little bit of time in the airport bar, ended up missing my flight, got a limo, went to some casino at some reservation out there in Minneapolis. Yeah. Prob yeah. And I got shut off for being accused of counting cards because I was <laughs> splitting, I was splitting aces. I mean, I was so banged up but and did you win any money well. and we were winning yeah and he, he I, you know i wasn't playing the right way we were just literally so drunk we didn't know what we were doing um but yeah and then i you know went home the next day got married and 20 years later got divorced and uh just keep chugging along <laughs> staying young yeah and run i yeah. love it oh well so any of the boys? I thought I saw one that went to college and played. Anybody follow? Not necessarily in your footsteps, but did they even play hockey? Yeah, so they all played, you know, youth youth hockey. And then the oldest, Alexander, uh, went. To, they both, Alexander and Nick, the oldest and second oldest, both played for the uh, the Junior Islanders on Long Island. Uh, Alexander is like six foot, a hundred. He's a def they're both defensemen. Um, but he's more of a mucker and finishes his hits. And he ended up at the University of New England in uh, Biddeford, Maine. And this was his last year. They ended up going to the final four D3 championship. Lost out in Lake, they were in Lake Placid. Um, and then the other one, Nicholas, played on uh, Junior Islanders. And he's 6'5", just like lanky tall natural and that's the problem everything he's natural yeah. so he doesn't have much of a work ethic and <laughs> so when he was challenged you know like you need to earn a spot after your second year he was like or oh, i could just you know go home and that that was his mo you know literally his i was like well I, that's not gonna work out well for you bud <laughs> but 
he lives here with me, um, eating my, me at a house and home, home and all that stuff. But Alexander was fun to watch. You know, we started taking those kids in youth hockey up to Lake Placid. Yep. And for us to go full circle and drive up there and watch him, uh, you know, finish his college career up there was pretty, pretty memorable. So did they, or do you, as far as your career, you know, did they, did you show them a lot of that? Did they, were they at the games watching, you know, I mean, how, because again, I'm, I'm assuming they weren't the same kind of player because again, the generation is different. Yeah. They, they weren't who you are, but uh, do you go through that stuff with them? Do you sit down and watch some of the highlights to fight real? Yeah. Uh, I think maybe when they were younger, they probably, cause they probably got their hands on uh, and now YouTube, you know, everything with the yeah. internet, they can see whatever they want. Um, I coached them all the way up to high school because the, the Alexander and Nick are 17 months apart. So every other well, that year. That might be part of the problem why they didn't go very far. <laughs> so, no. Well, our power play sucked, but um, yeah. I mean, we, we finished all our hits, basically. Yeah, you know, we, uh, not, no surprise. Yeah. Um, no, they were 17 months apart. So every other year they got to be together. Um, and that was fun. Uh, and I, I just think Alexander is, you know, more determined in, in, in competitive and like I said, Nicholas is just a natural. And so if it comes easy, then why work? Yeah. Well, because it only takes you so far, right? Right. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I think they know everything. Uh, you know, I don't know if they know everything, but, yeah. I th- you know, they have a good understanding. What about, uh, let's get a little bit into your career. Like you weren't drafted. And I, I think we all, I mean, I was super lucky that I did, but, but I think for me, there's a common denominator in all the players that, that weren't drafted. And I, and I think the words that you used a little bit earlier about work ethic, I think they all have it because you know that you have to work, you're not given anything and you've got to come in somehow, make an impression. I know you played a few years in junior. Um, what was it? Winnipeg, Kelowna and Spokane, I think were the three teams. Yeah. But it's funny, Mick, when I look at, your stats, I took a glance at them. Something stood out that surprised me a little bit. Uh, you were putting the puck in the net back then. Yeah, so at, at 18, I didn't get drafted. And I, I think I had maybe 10 goals that year. And then uh, the next year, I played with Brent Gilchrist in Spokane. Yep. And uh, I got on, I would go on the, the power play with Gilly. And I stand in front of the net and, you know, do what you do, create a distraction, maybe knock in a rebound, knock somebody down, whatever. And uh, I ended up putting up some numbers, thanks to Gilly, mostly. He sure. would look for me. I'm sure yeah. a couple just bounced off my ass and in the net. But Gilly was a great teammate. Um, and then, yeah, I, and then I think that, la- oh, so I went to a uh, Capitals camp as a 19-year-old, uh, undrafted, unsigned. And I was in the in a, a nightclub in Saskatoon, and Joe Kosher walked in, and we didn't, I didn't we were familiar, but I didn't know him, know him. And uh, I was about so he used to bounce at this nightclub when he was before yeah. he was drafted, and now I'm bouncing at the same nightclub. And Tony Twist's ex wife is the bartender. Like it's just a small world. Oh yeah, there's there's some connection here. <laughs> yeah, so Coach walks in and I, and I, it's kind of quiet. He's sitting by sitting by himself. So I just walked over and I said, "Joe, you know, Mick Fakoda, I don't know if you mind. Can I just pick your brain? I, I'm going to cap." He goes, "Oh, you got drafted? No, I'm a, I'm a free agent tryout. Like I'm going to try out." He goes, "Well, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, you're number 72 on a roster of 72." And I'm like, "Okay." So they don't know your name. Oh, gotcha. What do I do? He goes, well, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You got to get them to say your name. I'm like, okay, how do I do that? Get there. You're going to fight this guy, Dwight Schofield. And I'm like, oh, okay. Is he pretty tough? He goes, right, he's going to kick the shit out of you. I'm like, then what? He goes, well, you got to go back. And you got to fight him again. If you lose that one, jump him in the hallway. And if you got it, <laughs> suck him in the shower. I'm like, coach, this sounds like criminal. He goes, well, you want them to know your name. And that, that, that's one way to do it. So I get to Capitals camp. 
I'm in the rookies. We're getting sent back to the hotel before the vets. And I'm like, I, you know, and we didn't have the internet and all that then. So I'm like, I don't even know who this guy is. I don't know what he looks like. So I, I'm just stick around. You know, Kevin Hatcher walks in, Scott Stevens, Bobby Carpenter, Rod Langway, no Dwight Schofield. I mean, I don't see anybody. Like, they go to their lockers, and he's not there. This Monte Carlo 454 SS comes in the parking lot sideways, fishtails, pulls right up in front and stops. I'm like, Jesus, who's this crazy son of a bitch? I look at the plate, Sconan. No. <laughs> I swear to God, not Sconan. Like, Sconan the Barbarian? This guy gets out. <laughs> Flip-flops, short shorts, no shirt, no neck, veins popping out everywhere, zits all over his back. Yeah. I'm like, this guy. I walked away. I go, Coach, Co Co this must be one of those initiation joke things. Like, he's yeah. just messing with me. Nope. So I had to wait a couple of days to get in a scrimmage against him. And I said, we got to go, you know, and he goes, I don't fight nobody's. I appreciate that. So then I'm just going to run your goalie right now. Yeah. <laughs> and he looked at me and he knew I was going to go run the goalie. So we dropped the gloves and yeah, he beat the shit out of me. And then the next time I went to fight him next shift and then Brian Murray pulled him off the ice, put somebody else on. And then I fought that kid, like some no name. So I'm like, they don't know who the fuck I am yet. But we play New Jersey in a rookie game. And this kid from Anderson from the Devils comes across our red line, grabs a puck and goes back to his end. And like typical stu stupid me, like I'm like, I got it. I grab a puck, I go in and I take a shot on their goal in, in, in warm up. Oh, <laughs> I mean, full sail brawl. Yeah. No coaches on the bench, no referees, nothing. It probably took 30 minutes to, to get everybody cleaned up, sent us right to the locker room. And I can't do his, his uh, thing very well, Brian Murray, but, you know, he's got a little bit of a, a slur there. And he, the head coach of the Capitals, he comes in and he's like, Jesus Christ, what the hell's going on? And they all kind of point at me. And he's like, who the hell are you? And I go, uh, Mick Fakoda. And he goes, Mick Fakoda. And so I got him to say my name. And from that point, I got a, a couple games in the minors out of it, a couple, you know, beat, beat downs down there. And then I went back to junior and lit it up with 25 goals. You, you know, the funny thing is, Mick, Scoey was my first roommate in Montreal. Stop. I remember yeah. he played in Montreal. Yeah. And so and I found out that you played in Montreal at the end. I didn't even know that part. Yeah. Um but yeah, so I know I know the story with Scoey and man, that's all balls on with him. So so anyway, so again, I go back to hard work, but doing what you gotta do to get your name out there. And I guarantee they knew your name at the end of 24, 48 hours, what it was. So how does that translate from from that particular camp to when you finally get your shot in New York? So that after that after that overage year in junior, uh, I lit it up. Well, lit it up. Twenty five goals for me, lit it up. And uh, I had two offers on the table, si similar contract, three year deals, uh, three way, eighty five in the show, twenty five in the A, fifteen in the in the I or East Coast or wherever else. And it was Philadelphia and the Islanders. And so I didn't have an agent. It was my general manager, Bob Strum from junior he was doing my negotiating and i said uh well do me a favor call the capitals and tell them what we have because if they match that i'm going to them because they gave me my first they gave me a shot when nobody else would that's the very least i can do is is you know come get, give them the respect and uh i think it was david poyle at the time he's like yeah i don't think he has that offer so the best we could do is invite him back as a free agent uh, tryout. And uh, I said, all right, I'll just, and I, I wasn't going to sign in Philly because they had Dave Brown, Daryl Stanley, Craig Berube, Rick Tockett, Tony Horacek. Like they had weight enough. So um, the Islanders really had Brian Curran and Dale Henry, who's like a light heavy. Yep. Um, 
And so I, I said, I'll just give it a whirl there. And then I went in there and had had a, a really good, well, we had a really tough uh, young, like American League team. So we played a rookie game against the Rangers and Bob Nystrom coached us for that game. And there was 14 consecutive fights in the first period. <laughs> and we went in after the first, and I mean, Bob Nystrom, I don't, I mean, never seen a bigger smile. He walked in and he was like, man, oh man, I can't tell you how much I'm loving what you guys are doing out there. And we were like, yeah. <laughs> he goes, unfortunately, some of the higher ups would like to see if any of you can actually play hockey. So we're going to ask that, you know, unless someone does something really stupid out there, let's just finish our hit and, and just show them what you got. And, uh, and after that, we, we, you know, I got in a, I didn't get in a preseason game. Like a, a, I got sent to Springfield and which I couldn't believe. I mean, 25,000 a year. Oh my God. I thought I was the richest dude in this planet. Exactly. But, and you spent it all probably in the first uh, three months. Yeah. So, well, I don't know if you've ever been to Springfield, but they have some of the best strip bars in the yeah. country. They're totally, all good. totally nude. Bring um, your own. Bring your own. Some you bring your own. Yeah. But there was a place called the Mardi Gras, which I, now I find out is like a huge gang place. But anyways, uh, I was rolling in there with two, 300 bucks every day after practice. <laughs> and uh, after I think a month, Dale Henry was in the minors with me. And in the morning, he's like, hey, buddy, <laughs> how long do you think that you get paid for? <laughs> and I go, oh, I, don't, I don't know about you, bud, but I, I got a three-year deal. No, no, no. <laughs> pay period, pay cycle. I'm like, I don't know. Don't I get 1500 every two weeks for the, you know, for for the next 24 months yeah yeah he goes, no bud that stops at the end of the season i'm like holy shit i got like 200 bucks in the bank like three months into the season i'm like this is insane so that's how i figured that out but then i got called up that year um and that's when i had my first almost fight in the nhl well you know it, it you bring up that money thing mick i Today is different. I mean, what we needed at the time is we needed the kind of guys that had the guys that take care of you. You know what I mean? That that kind of give you the kind of info outside guys that are willing to take care of your money. And you know, we didn't give a shit at the time. But listen, right. we were not. We weren't. We knew we weren't guaranteed tomorrow, anyways. So so you get back to New York, and I think you had like Trache there, Potvin guys like that any any of those guys there and i know there's some of the the other guys that that were there but any of those guys had an influence on you there's a couple guys that i think you played that were there and i'm I'm curious to get your opinion on these two guys too were bobby bassin and gerald diddick yeah and those guys were great to me both um bass was my so bass invited me to live with him my first full year. So in 87, I got called up and then I was supposed to, I, I thought I was going to fight Dave Tiger Williams in Hartford. And I, he tapped me on the draw and I was like, holy shit, my first NHL fight is going to be dead. I'm like, my boys back in Saskatoon are fucking turning bar stools over right now. Yeah. You know, those big satellite dishes at some little bar out in the middle of nowhere. Sure. They are watching and they're flipping, the, they're flipping out. And so I watched the linesman's hand flinch, and that was it. Go gloves stick gone. And I turn around, he's gone. And I'm like, oh, boy. So I'm picking up my glove, and I go to get my stick, and I hear, bum, 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 What the fuck is that? There's Tiger, hands in the air, tied the game, 3-3. Three, three. <laughs> I'm like, I wonder if I'm in trouble. So I get back to the bench and Terry Simpson was the head coach. And I just feel holes being burnt in my back. And he goes, uh, listen, you're going back to springy. Keep doing what you're doing with the exception of that stupid shit. Yeah. And, uh, and we'll see if we can get you back up soon. And he did. I got, I got called up in March 
and I stayed the rest of the year. And then the following year, I made the team. And then Bobby Basson, he's like, hey, I got an extra room. You want to move in? And I was like, oh, that'd be great. Thanks, Bass. But you know Bass. Uh, I, I was, was going to go there. You go ahead and go there. <laughs> you go there. Yeah, so he's Christian, and he doesn't drink, and he doesn't do anything wrong, and I'm pretty sure he's was still a virgin, and and that that I I definitely am not a virgin, and I definitely know found out where all the watering holes were within 24 hours of my, you know, landing in his condo, and uh, the uh, the great thing about Bass is he's not judgmental. I was his roommate, and he accepted me which is part of what I think his belief is. Yeah. He accepted me. Yeah. And he, I'll tell you what, but talk about a competitor oh. and, and, and tough, like pound for pound and Bass to this day, ba Bobby Basson's our alumni director in Dallas. Oh, great. And, and Diddy, Gerald Diddick is like the assistant or the, the financial guy uh, of the alumni association. And I'll tell you what, like, <clears throat> We, we play, we have every, well, I shouldn't say every Friday. Uh, Fridays is our alumni day where we have uh, alumni games at Farmer's Branch, one of the rinks there in Dallas. We've got a beautiful room. Uh, the star is built for us. We've got very similar to what St. Louis had at the time, and ours is a little bit more updated than what they have. Um, they've actually, we, Bass and I went and looked at their room to see what they all had. And I saw the hot tub and I, we need one of them. <laughs> so we have something similar to that, but kind of new and everything was Budweiser back there. I said, we need that. So now we have like, we have a big bar in there. We have, uh, a couple tappers, huge fridge and all that kind of stuff. We have a sauna, we have our own room where our jerseys are all hanging, that kind of stuff name, you know, just like a regular locker room, but you, you bump into bass out there. And, and what we have, Mick, is so there we have uh, we have about 15 to 20 uh, just regular guys play men's league and business guys and things like that. And uh, they're called Friends of the Stars and, and they pay some some little fee, whatever it is, monthly. And so every week they can come out and skate with us. And, you know, we we try to even the teams up as good as we can. And uh, the chef, great chef at a local uh, restaurant, uh, he's one of the goalies. Um he gets to play for free, but we get all the food. So on Fridays, we get a big buffet after we got the whiskey, we got, you know, all the beer, the booze. And the other thing we don't have is a deal with Uber, which I really seriously think that, that we should have. But anytime you bump into Bob Basson, that fucking stick is right in your face. And, and he's chasing you all over the yikes. He is. He, he's that little Tasmanian devil. And, and I, I love it about him, the, the competitiveness and what he does for the alumni. You know, but like you saw, there's two sides to bass. There's yeah. a side on the ice. And then there's, you know, the family guy and, and you know, that kind of stuff. And every once in a while, he'll have a beer, but he stays on the straightener. And I'll tell you what, he's probably in bed. And bass was always in shape. I'm sure you, you saw yeah. that. He's in better shape now than he was then. But well, that's, that's the first thing. I was, I, that's exactly what I was going to say. Is I, I'm guessing without you telling me that he's in better shape now than he was when he, which is hard to imagine. Yeah, because you remember that silly, ah, um, uh, you know, with the arms. What are we talking about? Uh, the workout are you talking about the thing that's in front of the buildings that that does this. No, you know, in the locker room, it's a workout. It's it's like a bicycle for your shoulders. Uh, the uh, uh, UB, maybe UB, the UB, UB. Right? Yeah, Bass would go in there, and he would first he'd tell me, "If you you got to do the Bobby Nystrom workout," and I'm like, "What's that?" And he sets the dial, and he says, 15 minutes forward, 15 minutes reverse, three minutes shutter down, <laughs> nice bags, I'm out. I'll be at the strip joint. Yeah, Bass. Bobby Nye's workout. Shoulders yeah. were ripped, veins were popping, but he could do it no problem. Yeah, and Nye's always been in great shape too. But but again, that's why I think those guys all, even in their time, they were in great shape in their own shape and still won some Stanley Cups there. Mm -hmm. um, so then in comes some of the greatest guys on the planet and the Pat Flatleys and, and Hoagie and Richie Pilon, Glenn Healy. Um, what about playing with those guys? You know, I, and I knew, I, I remember Caniac, the, the practice rink, right? It's just, oh, yeah. just a fucking piece of shit, yeah. but, but nobody seemed to care, but it was probably didn't win as much as everybody wanted to, but what a great group of guys. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, so I saw heels, flats. Uh, I, I said that was this weekend. Um, I saw all of them, heels, flats, hoagie, with the exception of Chief, um, that last alumni weekend in the spring. And uh, they haven't changed. The, I mean, we, if you know, once you're in their company, this, you know, how the alum, yeah. when you're together, it's just, it's like yesterday, stories are flying. You know, everybody flax is like, remember the time? I go, I remember the time. Heels is like, you remember that time? I was like, uh -huh. it's all me doing stupid shit. And yeah. somehow we survived and I didn't get us in trouble. Um, but those guys, flat, flat for me was a mentor. My first, you know, Dennis was captain. And then the next year, Brent Sutter was. And uh, I remember Brent Sutter inviting me to his house for uh, a Christmas dinner uh, that first year. And you know, I was like, oh, because single guy, nowhere to go. You go to his house, his wife makes dinner. You know, I probably had 15 bats or whatever he had in the fridge. And then I'm, le I'm like, thank you so much. And he's waving. And then I'm like, see you tomorrow. And he's waving. And then I ran over his driveway light, plant turn, <laughs> plowed through his flower <laughs> bed. And he was saying, no, stop. Uh, but those are the things that, you know, I, when I see Pop Brent Sutter, I'm yep. like really sorry about that night. He's like, shut up guy. I mean, that was, it was hilarious. So. Well, there, that organization is, I don't know. I, I, I'd have to say they're similar to Montreal. I mean, you look at the, the time that they won the four Stanley cups that, you know, the history that's there and, and then the players that have, have gone through there. It reminds me so much of Montreal when I was in Montreal for a long time and, all the great players of Robinsons, Lafleur's, Gainey's, all those kind of guys, and the respect that we had. Um, I want to circle back just a second, only because I talked to, you know, and and I know you know Chris Nyland's story and the Last Gladiator and all that kind of stuff, and um, and you know, Nux, I'm sure you never did. You ever play against Chris? Yeah. Did you ever have a chance to go with him? No. Uh, well, it was. I don't know if it's considered a chance to go with him, but did you ever? Yeah, fight? yeah. So it was a famous line brawl, infamous, whatever, at the end of a, a game one playoff against the Rangers in the Garden, and uh, it was two seconds to go on an icing call, and Al puts out Gary Nyland, Ken Baumgartner, Brian Trotchy at center. Can't remember the other winger, and myself. So there's a face-off in our end with two seconds to go. And earlier in the game, uh, who was it? James Patrick, I think. Somebody hit Pat LaFontaine at the blue line. Had his head down, but I think Nyland was back-checking, kind of hooking him. Yeah. But Patty was a little distracted. And then I th whoever it was, I think it was Patrick, anyway, stepped up, knocked them out. Like stretcher. So game one, in the garden, our bench is just like, and, and Al puts us out for two seconds. Well, uh, you don't have to tell me if you're putting. And then Roger Nielsen sends out Chris King, Mark Jansen, Chris Nylon, Ron Greshner, and this guy, Jeff Bookboom. Uh -huh. And so uh, Bomber's like talking to me. He He's doing this little figure eight thing as they're getting set. And he's like talking to himself, but he's like, and who do you got? And I go, I'll, I'll, I'll grab Nyland. He goes, no, Gary Nyland has Chris Nyland. And I'm okay. I go, uh, I'll grab Chris King. Nope, he's mine. I'm like, we're running out of time. How about I just go to my D? And he goes, done. So I'm on my way to my D, and I'm not going to fight or do anything with this guy. But then I hear the crowd go crazy. And it's Bomber hits Chris King. Mm-hmm. So I learned a very valuable lesson back in junior. When you're in a line brawl or any type of brawl, it's your responsibility to take care of your guy and then go help other guys as quick as you can. Yeah. So I go out, I hit this kid, and he, he's kind of looking at me, and I just drop my gloves, and I just start feeding him. And he goes down, and I turn around, and there's nobody fighting. <laughs> They're all just kind of shoving, and I'm like, what the fuck? You know, I, I don't know. I thought I did my job. So long story short, I ruined that 
Bloomberg's career. He retired. I didn't yeah. know he was a born again pacifist, which they don't put in the program. You know, they said he was 6'2, 215. Yeah. Roger Nielsen put him on the ice knowing that something was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you know, you want to eliminate the chance of getting your ass knocked out and laying in the garden of these people cheering and, you know, celebrating it. So you just do what you do. Yeah. And, and anyway, I got suspended from it. And Nile, Knuckles said to me, so I seen him here on the island. He ended up sleeping at my house. Shocker. Um, and he's, he, he said, no, nah, I could tell in your eyes. You had, you, you're not, you, you're a little crazy. <laughs> and I, I'm like, but you're not. He goes, yeah. I am too. But, but Nick, that coming from Nux, that's a compliment. Yeah, way it's one of the biggest compliments I ever I've ever had. Absolutely. Yeah. I want I want to you you brought up Bomber a couple of times. Uh, and again, if pe- people don't know, Bob Gartner was probably one of the smartest guys on the planet. Number one, and you you never got that sense until you actually had to sit and talk to him and go, what you know, who's this guy? Yeah. Do you remember when Ty Domi and Bomber had each other's helmets? Yeah. When they came back onto the ice, yeah. I'll let I'll let you tell the story because I I just thought it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen, and, and it, it it just I, I wish I had video of it. But go ahead, tell the story. Well, I, I can't. I, I remember that they'd been grabbing shit and they'd been going at it all game. And Bomber, he he's not like that. You know, Ty is. Ty wants to fight. Ty wants to screw around all the time. And I they went to the box. And when they came out, they'd had the wrong helmets. And I don't remember if they, they threw them at each other or just tossed them at each other's feet. But I know that Ty had a lot of respect for Bomber. Like, everybody did. Yeah. And Bomber, just like you said, he was super intelligent. And while Ty put on Bomber's helmet in the box and was laughing and, and you know, like how Ty is, he's a showman. And he's going to get the most entertainment that he can. Um, where I know Bomber was probably just pissed. He was just sour. The when they came out, and Ty had Bomber's helmet, like you said, and Bomber had Ty's helmet. Well, well, Domi came out first onto the ice at the end of the period or whatever it was. And people that don't know, Bomber had long golden locks, and a, you know he had the Jofa helmet, and you know, his hair was flying, kind of like Marty McSorley, very, very similar yeah. in their looks, right? Well, Domi comes out, and Domi's got a head like the size of the pontoon boat I'm looking at out here on the water. And so he's got Bomber's helmet, and he took a towel. Oh, that's what Yeah, he took a towel, and he ripped it in shreds, and somehow he glued it or stuck it in the back of the helmet, and he came out on the ice, and he was shaking his golden locks around. Well, then Bomber gets the idea. He's got... Domi's helmet and Domi has a you know a huge head and he comes out and he starts spinning the helmet on the top of his head <laughs> just spinning it around in circles just to show how big uh Domi's nice head, is. head was I just thought they were both brilliant at the time and it was entertaining I want to know about the you you're not like it I, I've talked to a few guys you know they some of the guys that are, you know, were the, were the tough guys at the time that they played, and you hear the stories about they really didn't want to fight. You know, they just knew that that was part of their job. And and I, and it's funny, I asked Nux that question, and I kind of knew the answer before I asked it. And Nux wasn't one of them guys. But he did tell me, he goes, Luds, you know, I, I was one of the first guys. Guy Lafleur, back in the day when Flower played, I would get to the rink probably around five o'clock and I was telling, talking about this uh, when I was talking to Nux and I said, you know, we, I'd get to the rink flowers sitting in his stall with done up from his skates up to his pants, sitting there having a cigarette. And Nux was the other guy that was there. Nux would say, you know, Luds, I, I was good at night. I was good. You know, I had my pregame nap then about two, three o'clock. It's kind of started kicking in. I went down to the rink and I needed to be at the rink and kind of, Kind of like goal scorers, I suppose. You know, they run things through their head, the goaltender. Sure. He ran that scenario through his head, and he goes, no, I, I wasn't afraid at all. I was actually looking forward to it. And, and how about you? Like, you know, you, you kind of – you had to do the shit. And like you said, you know, you're, you're a big dude. And so you're probably not looking – down the roster at the two or three fighters that, that are third on the list. You're probably thinking that's the big dog and that's who I got to go at. How did you approach that stuff? Yeah. So I would say 
over the, if you looked at all the fight footage of my career, um, there there's definitely two versions of me. There's the grab the pants, flip the guy, just end it. And there's where I'm pissed and I'm just going to trade. And the results are obviously significantly different. Like, I really don't feel like I lost the fight when I was pissed. But the premeditated stuff, you know, you're sitting on a bench for two periods. You've had one shift. They go up five to two. Somebody's running around. You get the tap. Um, I didn't always feel angry. You know, I, I knew I had to do it. I had to do something at the very least. Or they're going to call someone up else or trade for somebody, and they will get that job. Sure. So. So you try to stay motivated, but obviously, like, you know, I knocked out Al Secord because I was pissed. I yep. mean, of all the people, he was not someone I would want to hit like that, but it's a fight and it's better me than him. I actually got a phone call that night from my my dad. Uh and he, he asked me, How could you? In Chicago. Yeah. And I'm like, Dad, how, I'm like, how could you? <laughs> I go, that could have been me. He goes, Well. How, that guy's a legend. You can't. Yeah, yeah. Um, I get it, Dad. Trust me, I didn't feel great about it. Sure. You know? There's a lot of other guys I would prefer that that happen. So, I answer your question, Luds. Like, uh, I always knew that that was the only thing that was going to keep me in it. If I didn't do that, I would not be in the show. So, sure. and I love practicing, ironically, because it's where I get all my ice time. Yeah. Um, I, I love my teammates. Yeah. You know how much fun we had yeah. in a short amount of time. And yeah. I got to do that for a decade. Yeah. I, which, I, right there with you. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it, it was a small price to pay to get to do something not, not, not like I beyond love because of all the extras that come with it. You know, your teammates, your relationships. The, I played for Al Arbor. In my opinion, he was to me uh, more than just a coach, like, I f I fucked up. I I that when I hit Glenn Healy in the face and s shattered his forehead because he wore that stupid Cooper helmet. Um, all I was trying to I was late for practice. All I was trying to do was get through the horseshoe, the first trip, make sure. a pass, cross, 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 pick up a pass, shot on goal, get to the back of the line, you're done. He's not going to watch you anymore. Unfortunately, right before I went to take a shot into his pillows, it rolled up on me. I ripped it, hit him right between the eyes, dropped him. Yep. And then heels being heels, he's not going to just let me go and calling me a stupid, you know, dank, drunk fuck, chasing yep. me around with his goldie stick. All um, right. So much for blending in. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then at the end of practice, Al called me in and he, he looked at me and I think most players in my position would be on their way down, whether it's, you know, the AHL, IHL, wherever you're gone, whether yeah. it's just to teach you a lesson, which you can easily go down there and disappear, never be back. Right. And he, he said, well, that was your chance. Don't ever let it happen again. And I can't tell you how hard I played for him. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for the rest of the year and, and every time, because he easily could have buried me and he well, would not let that happen. I I, th I think that there would be a lot of those similar stories with Al, you know, from, from the great players to guys like us. And, and again, I was there for a short time too. And I remember when I, and I don't know if all the meetings after that were like that. I remember the meetings and it was uh, Darcy Regeer and Lauren Henning basically ran everything up front and Al would stand in the back you know, and just kind of had his arms folded like that and let them do their thing. And even, even on the bench, there were times it was different for, you know, for me coming from Montreal at the time and, and there'd be times in the game and Lorne, or Dar uh, Al did the same thing. Those two guys kind of ran the bench and Al yeah. kind of stood in the back and they, you know, they changed and talked to guys and every once in a while, Al would come down and tap me on the shoulder and he'd go, what happened there? <laughs> like dude i don't know i wasn't watching either like i have no idea and i'm like so this is the legend you know but they all have scotty they all have their their ways of uh, of coaching i i want to circle back to, to 
to Al Secor. Al skates with us also. I play with Al on, on Tuesday nights, and then he, on the alumni thing, he's one of our alumni. And then there's another night that we play Wednesday nights, whatever, together. And, he, and you're a great, great human being. He will be on the podcast at some point. He's a pilot for American Airlines. Yeah, flies I all the time. I, uh, Mick, there was a – it's probably – six five six years ago there was a kid that i coached in the north american league when it was in dallas and anyway he he, he was done playing and he was playing men's league stuff and so he calls me up one day and I hadn't heard from him a long time and he goes hey coach he said chris and i said yeah hey what's going on he goes hey uh, everything's good i just want to ask you he goes you know the other night in men's league and uh you know this one guy running around this and that and he goes so i go up to him and i, I you know i chopped him in the leg and told him let's go and i said chris in men's league and you know like it, most of the men's league there you have some debating on the level you know it's back to that and this and i'm like what are you doing he goes i he goes this guy just kept running around and he bumped this guy and bumped into that guy and i said yeah i said you know whatever and i see he goes i kept asking him to fight and he didn't want to fight he wanted nothing to do with it he said so i just kind of skated by him and i chopped him in the back of the leg I said, oh, yeah. And I said, what happened? He goes, well, he dropped his gloves. I said, yeah. And then he said he proceeded to knock me out. And I said, what? And he's a tough kid. And, he, and I said, who was it? And he goes, I have no idea. And I said, well, what do you want to know? I, said, I just want to know who the guy is. And I said, I don't know what to tell you. He goes, the only thing I know is he's a pilot. And I said, oh. wait a second. His name wasn't Al, was it? And he goes, yeah, I think that's it. He goes, was it Al Secord? And I said, yeah. And I said, you dumb fuck. Do you have to know who <laughs> this guy is? You know, who is awesome. I said, you should, you should, you know, go and thank him. You know, that's going to be the closest you've ever gotten to anything. Let's, oh let's, talk about, lefty. I know you had obviously uh, Al Arbor. Lauren, was Lorne a coach? Lauren Henning at the time, was he ever head coach when you were there? Yeah, he did that shortened season. Okay. So he was there, but I know you did have Mike Milbury, right? <laughs> yeah, let's. I like the smile. Talk to me about Mike Milbury. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> you know, well, I, I, so I, I don't know how to. So I premise by saying Mike was always good to me. Okay. So that I mean, he he treated me very fair. Like, I'll, I'll, here's an example of the, the awkwardness of our relationship. One game that he was coaching. Um, he came in after the first period and said, well, you know what the problem is, is if Mick Vakota is our best player, we're fucked. Oh, my God. Stop right yeah. there. I'm going to let you finish this story. Hitchcock comes one day, in one day after a game in the second period, and I was playing with Bundy, uh, Sean Chambers. Yeah, yeah. He comes into the room, and I'm thinking this is where you're going to go. He looks at the rest of the guys, and then he looks, and he points at Bundy and me where we're sitting next to each other. He goes, how in the fuck are we going to win this game when Ludwig and Chambers are our best defensemen out there and our best players at this point? Is that what is that what Milbury did to you? Yeah. Yeah. And so from that point on, it wasn't like that point. Here's the difference. Like, I always played for coaches that wanted you to play for your teammates, right? Like, that. Yeah. that Al Arbor won uh, four cups as a uh, coach, but he also won three as a player. And he wanted you to experience the rewards of success and effort and being a champ and winning. He didn't want me to win for him. And then in comes, you know, Mike Milbury and it's like signing Brian Smolinski. And, the, you know, as he's leaving the room, he says, don't let me down. Don't let me down? And I understand that. And then we were in L.A. one night. And Dan Plant, he calls up from the minors. This kid's a, a college player, hard worker, fourth line, third line, just a gutsy kid. And he lines up next to Gretzky. And, you know, Milbury's butt hurt from when the Bruins lost to the Oilers in the Stanley Cup, you know, in the playoffs. Yeah. And he tells Danny Plant to jump Wayne Gretzky off the faceoff. And I'm like, I, don't do that. Yeah. Don't do that. You will end your career jumping Gretz right here for nothing and Gretz looks at me he goes kid he's an idiot I wouldn't do that so Danny didn't and he got sent down the next morning yeah that's yeah and so it was all these little things about us like bowing to him and acknowledging sure. him that started me on this path of this guy's an idiot yeah like not he's an idiot yeah and I, I couldn't get over it so you want the you know the end result 
Yeah, I want the end result. So we were in Detroit. We lost three to one. And we were on our way to the airport and we got fogged in. And so they just booked a, a hotel, one of the, like a little ex holiday and express, whatever, out at the airport so we could fly out in the morning. And a uh, couple of the guys are like, let's go to Windsor. And I'm always in on Windsor. <laughs> and uh, he said, as we were departing the bus, he goes, by the way, nobody go out tonight. And even though I didn't like him, I respected him. So I talked to the guys and I said, listen, I'm going to send some cases of beer up to your room, grab a deck of cards, we'll split them. We're on a seven o'clock bus anyways. Let's just do what the man said. In the room, crushing, I'm crushing Miller Lights, by the way. At that Atta boy. Yeah. Atta boy. Still got my scotty blood. So I'm pounding these cans, crushing them, playing cards, bam, down 2,000 in 20 minutes, which, yeah. you know, I don't have that kind of money. to. So I have to sit out. And uh, I'm going to sit in the corner and drink cans. And then I'm like throwing cans against the wall and being a donkey. And guys are making noise because they're playing cards. And we get a knock on the door and it's a security guard. I, I got it. And I go up there. I'm just in my boxers. I've been doing knuckle push-ups. Like I'm just losing my mind, right? Trying to pass the time. And uh, I walk up to the door and uh, the guy goes, hey, uh, you got to keep it down. People next door complain. And I'm like, hey. Why don't you get him another room? And the next time you come back, you better have more than you. <laughs> so he leaves and uh, they're playing cards. And maybe I'm like six more cans. Like I'm power drinking. I'm angry. And obviously remember back then, I never ate after games or anything. So, you know, the last food I had was a pregame meal. And there's a knock on the door. And it's Mike Milbury. Oh. Uh. And he looks in the room, his hair's all disheveled because they called him and woke him up. Yeah. And uh, he goes, uh, oh, you guys like to celebrate losses. And uh, it's like, Mike, no, that's not it. We just, you know, you said don't go out and, and we're just trying to get together, play some cards. It got a little out of hand. And I'm sorry, this is my fault. He goes, you, Mick, you're good. The rest of you suspended immediately. Oh, no. And I'm like. That's the only thing you could do to fuck me up is fuck with my guys. Exactly. Or something like it. Exactly. So I'm like, he, and he starts walking down the hall and I start following him. I'm like, Mike, I'm sorry. I realize this is embarrassing. It's not the way to act. You can't take it out on them. You got to suspend me, suspend me. I'm sorry. And he goes, no, no, you know what? You played hard. Those fucking guys didn't. And then again, I'm like, Mike, and she gets in the elevator and I stop the door. And he goes, don't do it. And to this day, I wish I did. Because he thought I was going to smash him. I, was I, I should have hopped in. Yeah. And just beat the shit out of him. Which probably would have been the same result because the following morning, I had a, you know, we flew back to New York, had a team meeting. Because I might have, I might have just did a little damage to the room after that. Like oh, of course, some of the items out the window into yeah, the yeah, rock star, rock star shit. There you go. And so in the morning, on the bus, uh, comes on, tell the reporters stay here. Calls the team off. We walk around the hotel. You know, all these items are out on the lawn, and uh, we get on the charter home. Waitress says, "I can't give you guys anything but beer, no water, no nothing." I'm like, Derek King's like, dude, enough. And I'm like, all right. Fly, to, fly back, drive back to the Coliseum, have a team meeting, you know, rips me, which without a doubt, like I, it's all self-inflicted. It's not like, sure. because I don't like him doesn't justify the result. And he uh, gave me a ticket to Utah the next morning. And uh, that was how my career ended with the Islanders with the exception of I went down to the minors and had the best time ever. Yeah. As, I'll, I'll show making, you. Yeah. Right. I'm still making show money, except that's where I met, you know, the person that couldn't bear children. And all of a sudden, yeah. ta-da! Surprise. Um, but yeah, my, my first or second shift in Utah, Butch Goring is my coach and we're on a two on one and I dumped the puck and change. <laughs> and Butchie walks over and he goes, Hey Mickey, how you doing? 
And I'm like, good, but she goes, uh, hey, just so you know, at this level, we consider a two-on-one a scoring opportunity. <laughs> he goes, I realize it's been a while. Yeah, and you might want to try to take a shot or make a pass. <laughs> And um, but Butchie put me on the power play. I was in front of that. Like I, I played hockey after ten years. Yeah, you got to. Yeah, yeah. I know. yeah. You weren't just that role player, right? It was fun. Yeah, but yeah. That that was my thing with Mike, and and yeah, you know, I, I regret embarrassing the team, but yeah. I mean, I was so close to doing so much worse. Uh, and See, you do it. There is a little restraint in you. You never thought there was. Yeah, well, and I, you know I why. Still, why Miller Light? Miller Light kept me out of trouble. Well, it's the Miller Light. I say that enough on this show. I'm hoping that we get them as a sponsor. Um, <laughs> I don't blame you. Hey, let's uh, let's talk about when you're done. Like, what what have you done once you retired? And um, what did where did you all go? And what kind of jobs did you have, or did you, or what are you doing? Are you doing anything that you actually have to work? You obviously are sitting at home in the basement right now. So, right. Um, well, I came home just for you, Lutz. Uh, <laughs> I, I like you. Um, Long Island was fine for me while I was living and playing there, but it, when it ended, I mean, we had a nice house, and uh, my my first wife, Marilyn, was an attorney hadn't worked because we were having kids, but had her, had her uh, law degree or passed the bar and uh, could work New York, Massachusetts, or Florida. Those are the three States that, you know, her bar was recognized in. And we'd always come to the vineyard, uh, Martha's vineyard out here in the summers and had our parents had a, had a couple places and we talked about getting a place, uh, and spending our summers here. And when we did that, uh, the kids were like, we, I was going to go, I played two years at the end in Utah, trying to resurrect my career. And then in a fight, I broke my pelvis. I came back and then it I was never the same. Like it just constant tearing of scar tissue. And it just, didn't, I never felt good. And so retired from Utah and we decided to stay on the vineyard year round. Um, and I was like, I'm not going to play hockey in the minors for 75 grand. Instead, I'll get a job working at the sheriff's department year round for 60,000. And that's what I did. I went to an academy and I became a deputy sheriff out here. And I was, I was transporting an inmate, a, a prisoner one day on the ferry boat back to the mainland. And Cam Neely walks by and he stops and he stares at me and he goes, are you? And I got the kid, the kids in handcuffs and shackles, right? Yeah. Because we you walk on a boat and then the other county picks them up when we get off the boat. And so I'm standing there next to this kid, and Cam really walks up and he goes, You gotta be fucking shitting me. <laughs> I'm like, hey Cam. He goes, They gave you a fucking gun. And the kid's like looking at me, he's like, Who the fuck are you? I'm like, I go, relax, shut. <laughs> Cam's like, kid, you don't realize he doesn't need that. <laughs> are you? I would listen to him. And he walked away. The kid's like, that's Cam Neely. You know Cam Neely. I was like, I, I know who he is. I mean, yeah, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I did that for like seven or eight years. And uh, and then I had an opportunity to get into waste management on this island. And that's what I've been doing for the last uh, 12 years, 13 years, is I manage a facility that takes all of our refuse from Martha's Vineyard and Ships it to the mainland. So you're a garbage guy. You're, you're, you're the king of the garbage guys. Trash is cash, baby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's your tagline. Yeah. Hey, it all pays the bills. You get to go home lunchtime. I I still I do want to tell you, Mick, before we wrap this thing up, and you, as as usual, you're you've been awesome. Um, my kids, whenever I mention your name, what do you think the first thing they bring up? Well. Uh, Eagle River? The go-kart you bought for him. Oh, yeah. That was a – oh, dude. You brought – Mick goes out, and my kids were – my twins were younger and came out to Wisconsin here where I'm at now and bought, him a, bought a go-kart home. And I, I think my wife at the time was like, what the fuck is going to happen here? Now you're giving these <laughs> little six-year-old kids or whatever they were 
a go kart to ride around. Right after that, you took my Harley for a ride. Hey, can I take it for a spin? And I, yeah, and you laid it down within about I don't know thirty feet. As soon as was you, it wet grass? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was the wet grass. I know it was the wet grass. <laughs> But um, but just and I the other the other story I, I told a few people when you came to Montreal, we went to Saint Sauveur. We went up to the mountain there and we found a little bar up there. All I remember is the ride home as we were coming down the mountain and you were sitting in the back seat and you just kept staring into the rearview mirror. And and I'm, I'm like because it reminds me of my dog whenever whenever we're Kim and I are riding and we're we're driving up to Wisconsin, my dog my lucky i got a three-legged lab so he just sits right there and all i can see in the rearview mirror is his head and every time i because he's looking out the front window because he's standing up on the little armrest in between i can't see shit out the back window it reminds me we're coming down the mountain and and you kept looking i'm like dude and i turned around i look at him and said what what are you doing he goes look at look at me look at me and i said what look at my eye i said what are you talking about i can't control my eye you got me so fucked up last night i can't control my eye just look at me and you stared in the rearview mirror all the way down the mountain you were so pissed because you drank too much and you couldn't control your eye it was all over the map is that bourbon street that was bourbon street exactly i remember i, I love where that. it was you yeah. know there, i went on a twister's iron horse tour a couple a few years yeah and i got to meet sid Daryl Sador. Yeah. And I can't remember who else was out there, but Daryl Sador what was, I loved the kid. I mean, we had some of the most fun and I met Marsh Grant Marshall when he was in New Jersey. Yep. And who else? Oh, you know, who was on the trip was uh, Maddie Richard, Matt, Richard, Matt, the Chuck. Three of my Maddie favorites, man. Yeah. Yep. And, Marshy, uh, Marshy was tough. Marshy was tough. Lefty. Oh. He was a tough kid that could take a punch and Sid had a had a good uh had a great career. I mean, he came from us uh from LA. He was hyper all the time, had to calm him down a little bit. Then he became an unbelievable defenseman with Zuby, won a cup with him and and Maddie. We know Maddie, so yeah. you know, you'll have to I'll let you know when Maddie's on the show and you'll probably want to tune into that episode. Half of it'll be bullshit, but but that's what we loved about Maddie and Hatch. <laughs> so anyway. Mick, I want to thank you uh, for hopping on, taking an early lunch. Um, you were awesome. I knew you would be. Uh, again, I, I'd say the same thing to you that I, I said to Nux. I mean, you guys are are invaluable in the roles that you had to accept. And, you know, you kind of thrived at them and you're good at them. But, you know, without guys like you, uh, those superstar guys, uh, they, they didn't breathe as easily when you guys weren't around. So, um, and uh, awesome that you're cleaning up uh, – cleaning up the island i mean that's good to hear you are one of the last of the dinosaurs i, I see that you wear that proudly yeah mick uh, Dakota. thanks good, Luds. Brother. Good, good catching up with you Luds. i appreciate it i i think you i'll have this cabin ready by next summer i think you might want to so let's schedule a little trip up here you can hang out on the pontoon boat for a few days i should probably get in the divorce attorney now and then ahead of time well they say four is the lucky number i don't know <laughs> give it a shot Thanks again, Mick. Sounds good. Thanks.